But this is really important. And you know by now, I've just kind of got into this flow where what I preach to you about on Sunday mornings is things that come to my mind at midnight on Saturday night or 4 a.m. on Sunday morning. Maybe one day when I retire from that old secular job, I'll have Thursday set apart like other pastors as my sermon preparation day and things like that. But until that day comes, I kind of like the way God does it now. I like bread that comes right out of the oven. Not something that was pulled off the shelf Thursday and wasn't sealed up good. Because see, sometimes in my house, my children open up the bread and they don't put the tie back on it. By the time Daddy gets to the bread, it's like cardboard. And sometimes that's what happens with sermons that lay around from Tuesday to Sunday. But I want to tell you, something has come out of the oven. And it's a word from God. Now listen to me. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says, command those who are rich. Now, how many rich people are here today? You bunch of liars. See? You just showed me how fleshly you are. You just told me what a secular, humanist, flesh-driven, worldly, carnal, if you want to call it a Christian, you are. Now, how many of you are mad at me? But how dare any of us come to church on Sunday morning and a pastor say, How many rich people are here? Not me. I ain't got anything. All, I'm, all I got is eternal life. A promise of heaven, a mansion in glory, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, a river of living water. The blood of Jesus applied to my sins, washed them away. I once was going to hell, now I'm on my way to heaven. I was once damned and cursed, now I'm blessed and have life and have it more abundantly. I ain't got much. You sorry bunch of good for nothing. Now let me ask that question again. How many rich people were here? Well, why ain't y'all paying y'all's tithe? <laughs> Suckers. You bunch of suckers. Now, not only are you a loser, but you're a sucker. Now, let's get serious. How many rich people are here? You know you're rich. Because... How dare we read the Word of God and think, well, he's talking about money, he's talking about wealth, he's talking about riches. This is Mike Murdoch's gospel. This is Kenneth Copeland's gospel. This is Dr. Todd Kuntz's gospel. This is Benny Hinn's gospel because it must be about money. No. Command those who are rich in this present age, that's those people that do have a nice house and a nice car, not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches. There it is. There are riches that are uncertain, and we could also say they're temporary, uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all the things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Now, how many people here today are willing to share? Liars. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. That they may lay hold on eternal life. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith, but grace be with you. Some have strayed. Look at your neighbor today and tell them, don't be a stray. You know what happens to strays? They end up in the shelter. Nobody claims them and they put them to sleep. Oh, you don't want to be a stray, do you? Tell your other neighbor, don't be a stray. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. God, how could we come to the house of God today and not desire to hear the word of God and to receive the words of life? And God, is it possible we could come to the house of God today and not realize we are the richest people on earth? We are wealthy in the things of God if we have nothing of this world. But Father, how has our focus, how has our attention been so directed and so consumed and entangled with the things of this world and this life and we have neglected the greater thing and the greatest wealth? 
that is in Christ Jesus. God, I am praying over rich people today, rich in Christ, rich with salvation, rich with the blessing and the protection, the hand of God. And let us walk from this church thinking differently than the way we came in because we have received those words of Jesus Christ that are life and life everlasting. God, help us today to get the right perspective in a fleshly dying world. Let us understand the best is yet to come through Jesus Christ. In His name that we pray, and everyone said, Amen. God bless you as you're seated. Can I say it again today? I am looking upon and preaching to some rich people today. Isn't it amazing how just five minutes ago you didn't realize you were rich? You didn't realize you were wealthy? Now if you go home from church today and you pick up the phone and you begin to call people, and you begin to say, look, I just wanted to give you a call and let you know I'm rich. I am now a wealthy person. They're going to ask you something like this. You must have won, did you win the lottery? Did you get a new job? Did somebody you love die and leave you some money? Because they're not going to understand in the spiritual what you are speaking of because the flesh does not understand the things of the spirit. But I hope you walk out of here today with a, with a sense and a feeling of regardless of what kind of jalopy you got sitting in the parking lot and regardless of how empty your pockets may be today, that you are walking out of this church a wealthy, rich person if you really understand what wealth and rich is all about. Now, I don't have time to talk about the prosperity gospel today, and I'm not. You know what it is, you know what it does, and you know who's doing it. And so let's just get away from that and just focus upon what real wealth and what real richness is. Because see, all of these things of this world and the idea of wealth and, and being rich in this world all does exactly what I've talked about over the last few weeks. It kind of leads us astray, as the Apostle Paul said. It leads us astray into paths where we believe that this life is the best life. That there's nothing after this. And I found an incredible uh, short article or column about that and included it in the bulletin today about how we dread the afterlife. There's a sense of dread about the afterlife. Like it's not going to be as good as this life. It's not going to be better than this. No wonder Joel said, you know, live your best life now. No wonder... Uh, uh, what the other knucklehead, he wrote the book, How to Be Rich and Have Everything You Want Now. And, and we fall for that line of thinking sometimes, and we, we fall into that, and the next thing you know, we begin to believe these false doctrines and this, this false teaching, this knowledge that is not knowledge at all. The Bible says that some have professed this, and because they profess this thing, they have led people astray into believing that it's about right here and right now. Now, this could be a little bit confusing if you don't track with me because there's a little bit of foundation that's got to be laid here, and it sounds like this. You'll hear the preacher get up and say things like this. Whatever you're going to do for God, you've got to do it right now. There's nothing more important than right now. There's nothing more important than right here and right now. Whatever we're going to do for God, we better get to doing it. Now, 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 now. And preachers and pastors have to do that because people are naturally inclined to procrastinate and to put things off and say, I'll serve God tomorrow. I'll give something to God next week. I'll talk to that sinner later when it's more convenient and I feel like it. But today I got a headache and today I'm just not in the mood and today I just don't feel like it and today I got something else I want to do. So pastors have to get up and say, right now, you got to do it now. We got to do it right here. We got to do it right now because now is the most important time. But then it's not and I'll tell you why. Now is the most important time in this life. But now is not going to mean anything in the next life. Now how dare we do this? And this is kind of one of the thoughts that come from this, the, the column in the bulletin that this man wrote, which is this. How dare we call it the afterlife? Because that means we're going to be dead. What happens after you die? Well, you go to a lesser life. 
You go to a place where you don't get to pursue your dreams anymore. You get to a place where you don't get to pursue your goals anymore. You get to a place where you give up family and you give up friends and you give up loved ones. And so because of that, we kind of develop this idea. We've gone astray and begin to believe that everything is about right here and right now. Everything about right here and right now is about serving God. That's what makes it the most important time. Not because of our houses and cars and careers and our, our dreams and visions about what we want in life, but right now is important because of what we do for God, but nothing is more important than what happens after you die. Because it don't matter how much wealth you accumulate now. It doesn't matter how much worldly riches you accumulate now, because once you're dead, you'll never spend another dollar. Once you're dead, you'll never receive another promotion. Whatever you are, when you enter heaven, is what you will always be. There's nothing to apply for. There's no resume to submit. There are no vacancies of positions in heaven for which you can get there and aspire for. You're just going to get there and be whatever you are when you get there. You understand that? Now, you only got 20 minutes to say amen three or four times, and I'm going to quit. This is going to be one of the greatest messages you ever heard. Well, maybe not. We look at the afterlife, and we say, well, when we get there, everything's behind us. It's all over with. It's all said and done. Well, just this life will be. But the best really is yet to come. You're already holding the winning ticket. They just haven't called your number yet. But how many people in here want their number to be called right now? (laughs) Nobody, right? Oh, I know it's a great mansion. I know it's a beautiful place. I know I'll be with God. And I really want to go later. I really want to go after a while. We get up and sing all these songs about heaven and I can't wait to go and I want to get there and I want to see grandma and grandpa and I want to see my mom and dad and my brother and sister, but I want to do it later because I kind of like it right here and right now. I'm kind of doing my thing here. I'm pursuing what I really want right now. And the, the, the whole reason for that is we have no concept. We have no idea. Our wildest imagination cannot even begin to comprehend how wonderful that place is. But I promise you, it is. So what do we do with time? See, our physical bodies are inhabiting this time and this limited space, but here's the thing you need to know, but our spirits will inhabit eternity and that place. But we focus so little on where our spirits will be and what that place is like because we're so wrapped up in the time we have now and the limited space we have now. And it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why do we act like this time and this stuff is so much more important than that eternity and that place? But that's exactly what we do. And because of that, we are more wrapped up in this time and this stuff rather than that eternity and those people. Now stay with me. See, we're wasting and we're squandering a lot of time right now on things that have no eternal value, that will not survive or last after the rapture, that you will not take with you on the other side of the grave. See, God has given man a short time upon this earth. And yet upon this short amount of time, This little bit of time that God has given us, all of eternity hinges. All of eternity counts. All of eternity keeps a score of what we do with this little bit of time. All of eternity depends on about 70 or 80 or at the most 100 years. And I can look around at some of you today and tell you, you ain't going to make it to 100. You look like you should have already been put in the ground. You look like you already should have been laid out and us stood over you and sung Amazing Grace. You're just 
lucky to have one more Sunday to hear one more sermon. And you better, <laughs> you better count on this. You've got 86,400 seconds in a day. And you better understand that every single one of them is precious. And every, one of, every single one of them is valuable. And it's not because of what you can do with those seconds to, to get something in this life or to achieve something here unless it's something for God. But to understand that just as quickly as I can talk about 86,400 seconds, many of them just went away while we were talking about it. 31,557,600 seconds in a year, and it's gone just like that. Death is nothing more than a turning over of this time to a place called eternity, to a place called heaven, and life everlasting where there will be no more clocks. No more calendars, no more wristwatches. So you hear me today. You have an eternity to enjoy the honeymoon. How many of you remember your honeymoon? Oh, wasn't it wonderful? It was all downhill after that, wasn't it? You have forever. Oh, I'm going to pray for him. Some of you men are going to have to help him to the car when his wife gets done with him. You have eternity. To enjoy the honeymoon. But you have just a brief amount of time to prepare for the wedding. The wedding is going to be here just like that. Jesus often talked about His return for His church. His meeting with the church in the air as being like a wedding. The bridegroom is coming for the bride. The marriage supper of the Lamb has been made ready. And when you step over onto that side and that marriage supper of the Lamb occurs, it's going to be a honeymoon forever. It's not just going to be a few days. It's not just three days and and four days and three nights in Gatlinburg. It's not just a cruise on a carnival cruise line. Why anybody would go, I don't know. But it's forever that you get to enjoy the bliss and the wonder and the spectacular scene of heaven. But you only have a brief amount of time to prepare for that. But you get to enjoy it forever. Why don't we understand? Why don't we live today like the everlasting life, like eternity? And what happens after this life is more important than this one. We come to church and agree that it is. And we walk out of the church, we don't live like it is. Why is that? Listen to me. Charles Spurgeon said the best moment, you'll, ne you'll never believe this, but the best moment of a Christian's life is the last moment of a Christian's life. Let me say it again. The best moment. Now, I don't want everybody to go home and kill themselves. I don't want anybody to go home and pray that you're going to get sick. I don't want you to go play in traffic. I don't want you to go take up skydiving and rock climbing and rappelling. I don't want you to do anything to speed up your time. But I agree with Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, who said the best moment of a Christian's life is the last moment. But see, we talk about the afterlife like it's something we dread, like it's something we're not looking forward to, or we want to put off forever. Like somehow we've been led astray to believe in these worldly riches and this worldly wealth that what we're living now is going to be better than then. Now let me give you some examples. When somebody dies, we say stuff like this. Well... I'm trying to be serious, but we're so dumb. We are so stupid. We don't know the Word of God. We are spiritually ignorant. That's why we don't live for God like we should. I, I, I'm preaching like somebody that's leaving. I know, but I'm not. We are so stupid. Not just you, me. And you know, it's, this is like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. The first step... The first step to fixing your problem is admitting you got one. Now look at your neighbor and tell him, your problem is you're stupid. <laughs> this is what we say, Brother Mike. Do you hear about so-and-so? They, they, they passed away. Oh, gosh. May they go rest in peace. Just rest in peace. Go 
lay down somewhere and rest for eternity. No wonder we dread it. Guys like me don't want that. I sleep four or five hours a night. What makes you think I want to sleep forever? Well, they have went to their final resting place. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I can go to a nursing home here, right? I can go eat jello and broth somewhere here. Oh, this is good. I'm telling you, man. This is the one that's going to get me the big church, this message right here. Just, just help me, okay? Just cheer and amen a little bit, and then I'll be out of your way and you'll be out of mine. You know I'm kidding, right? Well, they went to that great recliner in the sky. No more alarm clocks. No more going to work. When they get there, they won't even have to do this anymore. Oh, praise the Lord. No, it's a place to rest. Shh. Don't make a lot of noise in heaven. Don't you know there's people there resting in peace? Don't you know there's people there that are in their final resting place? Isn't that stupid? Isn't it? Come on, man, help me. Isn't it stupid? The dumbest thing you've ever heard? Well, they'll never have to struggle anymore. Well, their battle is finally over. It's no wonder. It's... It, it's how many of you here love to go hang out at the nursing home? None of you. You dread going there, even if your loved one's there. You don't want to go there and see the condition of those people. You don't want to go in there and spend time with all these people and they're wheeling themselves around in wheelchairs and they can't get out of the bed by themselves. Somebody's got to feed them because they're, they can't do anything. And somehow, we painted this portrait the heavens like that. It's the great nursing home in the sky. No wonder we're so wrapped up in this life. And it's all about right here and right now. And the best life now. And the prosperity now. And getting what you can now. And getting your house. And getting your ride. And getting your job and your career. And getting everything here. Because it's no wonder we dread getting there. But I'm here to pull the covers off of that. And reveal to you what Paul was saying in Timothy. That the best is yet to come. There are people that are wrapped up in their way and their riches here but we who are in Christ Jesus need to understand this right here and right now the best is yet to come I will give up all of this to get just a glimpse of that I would rather listen I would give up thousands of years of being a king or a president here just for a glimpse of what is there because I know the best is yet to come. And that's why Spurgeon said, Don't you fear death. Don't you fear the grave. Don't you dread the rapture. Don't you worry about any of that. Because the best moment of your life is when this life has ebbed away. And they've sung the songs. And they've preached the sermons. And they've told your life story. And while they're doing all of that, you are stepping over the line. From that life to eternal life. What was to what is. What is temporary to what is eternal? Man, why in the world would we be afraid of dying? Why in the world would we call it the after? After life. We call it after. Because life is so good. We call it after life. You know what we need to do? We need to do what that writer said. We need to start calling this pre-life. This ain't life. This is a temporary assignment. This is a journey. This is a process. This is uh, days of progress getting from here to there. I'm not going to call death after life. I'm not going to call eternity after life anymore. I'm just going to tell the world today, I am living in a state of pre-life because my best life, my greatest life, my eternal life is yet to come. Oh, yes. So understand this today. You passed the 20-minute test, by the way. The difference, the difference between a goal and a dream is a deadline. 
See, we've got all kinds of dreams. We're dreaming all kinds of dreams. It's not just the old men that are dreaming dreams. It's not just the young men seeing visions. It's just not the old men seeing visions and the young men dreaming dreams. But we all have dreams, at least if we're alive and we're looking forward to anything. But we dream dreams that we don't really pursue, that we really don't believe that we will ever see come to pass because we don't ever establish a deadline or a goal line or a date that we will achieve it. And because of that, they're just dreams. But the difference in a goal and a dream is a deadline. Now, let me ask you this. Who knows where the term deadline comes from? See, you know why? Because you're stupid. I told you that a while ago. See, you're... you're no, I'm just kidding. I'm not too mean. Let me tell you where the term deadline comes from. It'll help you understand. Does anybody know what a deadbeat is? Does anybody here know a deadbeat? <laughs> they come from the same place, deadline and deadbeat. They come from the Civil War. And what would happen when prisoners were captured during the Civil War, a lot of times they didn't have stockades and big fences and prisons and jails built to... to you know, restrain or to incarcerate the enemy or prisoners of war, they would simply put them in, a, in a, like a corral that had a fence. You could climb over the fence. And sometimes it would just be a single rail. Or even, get this, they would tie a rope around some trees or posts and they'd put the prisoners in there. And they would say, now you stay in there. You are a prisoner of war. And then they would come out 20 feet from that railing or that rope or that fence and they would draw in the dirt or the ground a ring 20 feet out. And they said, go ahead and climb over that rope. Go ahead and climb over that fence. Go ahead and do whatever you're going to do. But if you get to that line, you will be a dead man. And so they called it a dead line. You could take your chances and meander around on the fence or the rope or wherever the areas of, uh, that you were confined. But if you ever got to that place where a, a single guard or maybe a couple guards were, they had authorization. They were authorized to go ahead and kill a person when they got to the line. And therefore they called it a deadline. And in our world today, it has become a term that means after this, there's no other chance. And then they also coined the the term deadbeat. And it was like this. A beat was somebody that didn't do their job. A beat was somebody that wouldn't fulfill their duty. A beat was somebody that was a gold bricker, a sandbagger, or would feign illness so they wouldn't have to do their job and do their duty. So later... That term evolved into deadbeats. So now we deal with deadlines and deadbeats. And guess what? The church is full of deadbeats that are facing a deadline. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, did he really say that to me just now? Now, I'm stupid, but I didn't need to hear all that. But here's what I want you to understand. See, we dream these dreams about what we're going to do for God and where we're going to go and how we're going to spend eternity. And we don't realize that there is a line drawn somewhere. It's called the grave or it's called the rapture. And we are just about to that deadline where once we get there, there is not going to be anything else in this life, but the best is yet to come. I agree with that. I've preached that today. I've expounded on that. I've pontificated on that until you're tired of hearing about it. But I also want you to understand while the best is yet to come, the deadline is right at our feet. And I don't want to be found to be a deadbeat at the deadline. I want to cross that line from this pre-life to real life. From this pre-life to the most abundant life. From this pre-life to the best life. From this pre-life to the greatest life, to eternal life. I want to get there and I don't want to get there and be a deadbeat. Because here's what I really wanted to get to. See, we got this little speed bump. How many of you love those little speed bumps? You know, you're driving down the road and you're going to speed you want to go and all of a sudden somebody's, ah, oh, there's a speed bump. And you're scared. And you slow down a little bit because then you're going to go, Ugh. Because see, the government thinks you're too stupid. <laughs> oh, gosh. 
my self-esteem, you're killing me today. I'm going to Joe Osteen's church next Sunday. I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to fly to Texas and hear what a great person I am. We put up a speed limit sign that says, slow down, but you're too dumb to slow. Slow down. We put up signs that say, children at play. You're too dumb to slow down. You're too much of a hurry. So we put a bump in the road so that you'll get to it and you'll have to slow down. One of these days, we're going to take up the speed bumps and we're going to put down deadlines. And when you're driving too fast, we're just going to shoot you. <laughs> so you don't kill some innocent kid who's chasing his ball into the highway. They got a lot more life to live than you. You had your chance. Now listen to me. You know what the speed bump on, on the, this whole process is? The judgment seat of Christ. We're motoring down life's highway. Life is a highway. I want to ride it all night long. Y'all heard that, right? That's a favorite trooper song ever. Life is a highway. Speed bump. <laughs> Judgment seat of Christ. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. Coming into heaven. Slow your roll. Let's talk for a second before you go any further. There's that speed bump. Wait a minute. What he said about time was really true. What he said about money was really true. What he said about commitment was really true. What he said about sanctification and holiness and worship and prayer and preaching in the Bible, it was all true. It's going to slow you down just a second. You're going to hit that speed bump, and you better thank God today that what is a deadline to the sinner is a speed bump to the Christian. Amen. You hear me today? The time is waning. Yes, that's right. Help me, son. Help me, daughter. Time is running out so quickly. I, I, I just wish we understood there, there's something that is more important than time. And you, you, you're so used to hearing preachers say time is so important. We need your time. God needs your time. And, and all of that is true, but you have to understand it in the, tro in the proper perspective. And maybe that's where I failed as a pastor to make you understand that, yes, time is important. Yes, now is important. It is the most important thing in this life. But you understand this. Jesus said, Jesus said, the book of Revelations in 10 and 6, the Bible tells us this great angel comes down from heaven and he says, by the way, the one, Revelation 10 and 6 says this. Let me paraphrase it. Let me take out the these and the thous and the, and the, and the haths and the hath nots and just say this. This angel comes down from heaven and says, I have just talked to the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything else. And he has told me to tell you that there is a time coming when there will be no more time. No more watches, no more clocks, no more calendars, no more 1045s on a Sunday morning, no more opportunity, no more second chances, no more one more time. Time is gone. No more now, not another moment, because just like there will be no time, I know this is going to make your head hurt, and I know you're too dumb to understand this, but listen, no more now. Don't get mad at me, okay? When we all get to heaven, how's it go? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Okay, I'm with you. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Then what? Okay, we saw him. We shouted. Now what? Oh, do it again. Just sing it again, right? Oh, no, no, no. How about this one? I'll fly away, oh glory. 
When I die, hallelujah, by and by. Okay. When you, when you fly away and you get there, then what? Just keep flying? Just do what? We, we don't even know what we're going to do. Now we know. And he's right. We know. There's going to be a time of praising. There's going to be a time of rejoicing. This is what we say, Brother Wally. Oh, gosh, about that. That great reunion in the air. Any of you ever been to a family reunion? <laughs> How'd that go for you? And, you know, I'm from West Virginia. And you know what they say about us. We go to a reunion to pick up chicks. Oh, y'all know y'all heard all that junk. It hurts me. It hurts me deeply. We call it a reunion. And, and please don't get mad at me. I'm just, I'm just talking to you from my heart. I'm telling you what God says. I get it. I want to see my grandfather. You're looking at a cat that lost his dad when he was 14 years old. You think I don't want to see him? You think I don't want him to see my son and my daughter? His grandchildren that did not even, were not even alive when I lost him? I want that reunion. But I've been to all kinds of family reunions, and every single one of them, I was glad when it was over. I would ate all the chicken and potato salad I could eat. You go to one of my family reunions, and I'm not exaggerating this. The last one I went to was up in the hills of West Virginia. And our family, you got to be one extreme or the other. You're either saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, and on your way to heaven, or you're a convicted felon smoking pot. There is no in-between. And our family reunions are just like that. And the last reunion I went to, half my family was sitting on picnic tables and in lawn chairs, and they had a guitar out, and they were singing old gospel songs. They were rejoicing, talking about heaven, and the other half was behind the barn smoking pot, drinking. And I couldn't decide which one I wanted to go join. <laughs> Now, why do I always feel like I have to say this? But it's because of the expression on some of your face. I'm joking. <laughs> Never smoked pot in my life. Wanted to. But reunions, we, we, we talk about it. Okay, how long is this reunion going to last? How long can I hug my dad? How long can I tell him, this is Matthias, this is Madison, this is Madison, this is Matthias. This is my wife, Missy. You never met her either. Okay? We all have met each other. We all know each other now. And my dad says something like, well, hey, they told me up here you was a preacher down there. I'm very proud of you. Okay, how long's all that last? Because it's a great reunion in the air, but it's not a reunion that's going to last forever. The reunion part is when you get together. I'm just trying to tell you this today. Somehow we got the idea that this life is so great and so wonderful that we look to heaven and we say, well, it'll be great because I get to see a few people. It's a great reunion. I'm going to fly. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to shout the victory. I almost said shoot the victory because I've wanted to do that too. And then we have no idea what's going to take place after we've been in heaven for two hours. And I just feel like telling somebody this. When God said in His Word, the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, neither has the heart of man conceived the things that God has for you and you. And you, and it's going to be, listen, the reunion is going to be a great part. Seeing Jesus is going to be the best part. Getting past that little speed bump of the judgment seat of Christ when we're corrected there for a moment, and reminded of where we come up short a little bit. But then it is the life that no one can imagine living. Sometimes we try to talk about it. We try to say no more headaches, no more sickness, no more disease, no more graveyards or cemeteries, no more funerals, no more funeral homes, and, and no more bills to pay, no more enemies to face, no more battles to fight, 
No, no, more, no more struggle and, and turmoil and tribulation. None of these things. But I just got to tell somebody today, I wish I had the words to tell you. I wish I had the imagination to paint the picture. But I can't. But I can tell you this in faith. It's going to be better than you could ever imagine. It's going to be more wonderful than you could ever conceive. I don't know how God's going to do it. But I know God's going to do it. I don't know how He's going to erase the memory of the one you love that didn't make it but I know when he says in Revelation he is going to wipe away every tear he's going to wipe away every tear and if Fido and Snooky and Bubbles has to be there to make you happy then good news they're going to be there a little bit's going to make it Coco's going to make it if it takes a football field to make you happy, there's going to be a football field. I don't know what there's going to be there. But I know this. It's going to be better than anything here. The worst thing in heaven is better than the best thing on this earth. What would it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? It's more than just a reunion. It's more than just a shout. It's more than just singing a song. It's more than just sprouting wings and flying. If it's just about wings, I can go drink Red Bull. They say it gives you wings. Stand with me, Brother Mike, come. If you're not stupid anymore, I want you to say amen. amen. If you're rich today, I want you to say amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you love your pastor today, I want you to say amen. 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 I'll stay. I'm staying. You know, you could easily sit there and look at me today and say, I can't believe he said those things to me. I can't believe God said them to me. The difference between you and I is I've known this truth a couple more hours than you did. I haven't been walking around for six years thinking, boy, I really need to tell those stupid people this. I'm, I'm flesh and blood like you. The Word of God is the promises of God. The solution to every problem. The answer to every question. The hope for the hopeless is right here in this Word. And this Word tells me there's a place called heaven and I don't have time to tell you but we're all so, st so stupid, we think we're going to live in heaven forever. And I'll have to preach that Wednesday night. I'll have to finish this message. But the Bible tells us in Revelation, God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And you're going to go back and forth all the time. You'll be able to ride a drop of rain. Like Paisley said, you'll be able to run your hand through the mane of a lion. Ride horses or fly all by yourself. Whatever you need to do. You'll see heaven, you'll see a new earth, you'll rule and reign as kings and priests with Christ upon this earth for a thousand years and then for eternity. You'll see a place called the New Jerusalem that doesn't need street lights or a sun, for the Lamb of God is the light that shines. And it's a place where it's always day. And the Bible says there is no night. So you can't even say, what are you doing Tuesday? I ain't no Tuesday. If it's Monday, a night's got to come to get you to Tuesday. It's always, always now in heaven. It's always forever in heaven. It's always life and life everlasting.